Let's stand for the reading of God's Word, Luke chapter 22. Our text today is coming from Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 54. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, You will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Father, this is your word. This is the pure, undefiled words from your heart to ours. Lord, as we dive into your journey, your journal this morning, I pray that we would have a heart to receive, being instructed, being guided with the light of uh, that is shining in our path from your word, that is a lamp to us, I pray that we would be able to see and walk therein, obediently following you. Bless your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. Did you hear the story about the bad conductor? He tried to run a symphony and did such a bad job, they decided to electrocute him. Well, they tried, but... Like I've told you, he was a bad conductor. <laughs> Failure. All of us experience it, but many of us compound our failure by failing to recover. Abraham Lincoln said, My great concern is not whether you have failed, but whether you are content with failure. Peter failed the Lord. Failure causes paralysis, avoidance, fear, hopelessness. Failure is something that we all experience. But it's how we respond to failure that really decides where we are in our walk with the Lord. See, Peter failed. But as we're going to see... There was a time and a place for Peter's restoration. And I want you to know right here, right now, in this very moment, that if you are honest with yourself and you're aware of failure that is staring you in the face, how you have failed the Lord, how you have sinned against Him, there is a plan in place, in motion by God to restore you if you respond to His invitation to restoration. He wants to restore us. I, I, I have so often, in decades of walking with the Lord, I cannot tell you how many times I have failed to respond correctly to my failure. So on top of my failure, I continue in failure by not responding to my failure correctly. There's a saying in in the business world, that once you try something and, and you fail at it, the biggest distraction is continuing in that failed state over and over and over again because you have failed and never moving toward being successful. Now, I'm not one of those preachers that preach about, oh, success, and, 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 it's, and it's your day now, your, your time now. What I, what I know from having walked with the Lord is that my failure too often has paralyzed me and has caused me to avoid Jesus. 
See, I'm thinking of this last verse that we read when it says that, that the Lord, it, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. His response was right in that there was grief, there was remorse. And I felt grief and I felt remorse, but I wasn't confident in my ability to be right with God after that, so therefore I just avoided God. Have you ever avoided God? Now I'm sure you're sitting here thinking, I thought God was omnipresent. I thought He's everywhere. You can't really avoid God. Oh yeah, you can. You can turn your shoulder to God. You can avoid Him. Whenever you owe somebody something, I know none of us in here, but people sometimes when they owe somebody something, they avoid them. Oh, you better believe you owe the Lord something. When we fail Him, when we sin, we owe the Lord something, and too often we avoid Him. We avoid eye contact. We avoid time because we say, I'm not worthy. Well, you were never worthy to begin with the very first time you came to Him. That's not what makes you unable to come to God, whether you're worthy or not. But yet, it's amazing how we've walked with the Lord so many years, many of us so long, and yet when we sin, we think we're not worthy. When the most important thing to do is to acknowledge our sin, acknowledge that we failed Him, and run immediately to the cross and ask forgiveness for our sins, get that restoration, get that relationship back stay in harmony get back in harmony with God but too often uh, because of our failure we become paralyzed and we avoid God and we move into fear and all these things and then we actually just prolong this thing whenever the reality is we need to know today and accept the fact that we have failed we do fail but what makes God's people his people are people who repent see David was the apple of God's eye and yet that guy was a scoundrel he he continually messed up the Bible shows us horrible things that he did but what was it about David is David was a man of repentance read the Psalms and you'll see that it's, that's what he does so let's think about Peter let's let's look a little bit about Peter we reading in Luke chapter 22 but remembering that the disciples were something else to say the least as you get to really reading the Gospels and learn more and more about the disciples, you wonder if these were adults sometimes, how childish they were. Here's an example. Early in this very chapter that we were looking at in chapter 22, in verse 24 we read this, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Here they are in the upper room just hours before Jesus' arrest, and could you imagine sitting around in a, in a deacon's or pastor's meeting or church leadership meeting, sitting around the table before a service or something, arguing about who's the best? Can you imagine that? No, nobody would do Here are these guys who have just spent three and a half years with the living God with skin on in the flesh, hanging around with Him, watching Him move miraculously, teaching and preaching about love and gentleness, and here he is with them, and they are arguing about who is the greatest. See, uh, the reality, I believe the truth is that, that in that time, maybe this culture wasn't like our culture today where we had mastered the art of hiding our pride. See, today, we know how to be creative and look humble when we're bragging about ourselves. Oh, we see it all the time. All you got to do is look on the Facebook and you'll see people, 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 oftentimes they'll tell a story that just so happens to admit it, how great a th same thing that they did. Oh man, I was walking by the road and I saw this guy over there and I, and I gave him $40 or whatever, you know, poor guy over there didn't have no way. And somehow or another we, we, we know how to mask it when really the the the, the the situation and our hearts still are the same in that we like to be lifted up and exalted. We really like to get in the pole position. Just go watch us drive out on 59 or 45. We want to be out there in the front. We want to be out there in the first. And, and we're in a hurry. But yeah, we, we still, in our hearts, want to be number one. See, it's the truth of our flesh. Now, you're, on, you're not doing yourself any favors if you don't acknowledge that. 
Now, we don't like to acknowledge that. We like to say, oh, yo, no, no, that's, that's not who I am. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I'm not like that anymore, whatever. I'm a new creation. Absolutely, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. There is a new creation in you that God created and put inside of you this old person who still has desires for the flesh and to please itself. Your flesh still wants to be on the throne. This has not changed. And this is what's going on with these disciples. And this is not the first time. In this very gospel, if you were to turn back, and you don't have to, I'll just read it for the sake of time. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 46, you find this exact same thing happen again. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. This is not a new, fresh argument. This is something that's been going on. They are trying to be number one. Now, this is something that if you really observe the disciples, you will find that Peter was no exception to the rule. Matter of fact, I think he was the rule. He was the example of people trying to be in the pole position. There's a conversation that was a prelude to Peter denying Jesus Christ. There was a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples and a response that Peter gives concerning how much his disciples truly loved him. And there was a prelude to this that Jesus confronts Peter and says, I'm telling you what we just read, you're going to deny me three times. Now, you can read this account in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But as is with the Gospels, the Gospels are, are witnesses, they're testimonies of what happened. Now, if I was to ask somebody about what happened here today, um, uh, you would tell me all true things, but you wouldn't necessarily tell me everything. I could ask somebody else, and they would tell me another true story, the same thing about what happened, but they might include some other details. So for the sake of fully grabbing this conversation, I'm going to read to you what happened, but I'm going to read it as a compilation. I'm not going to change the words or anything, keeping it in the order from Matthew and what Luke says, what John says, and what Mark says, the full conversation, so you can really understand understand what happens here so prior to him denying prior to jesus being arrested here's the chronological conversation and it says in matthew 26 in verse 30 and when they had sung a hymn they're in the upper room they went out to the mount of olives then jesus said to them all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Jesus has taken his disciples out to the Mount of Olives and he's telling them, all of you will be made to stumble. All, A-L-L. -L. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will will never be made to stumble. I want you to see Peter not just saying, I will never stumble. I will never fail you. I will never be offended. I will stay with you. I'm right there with you. He didn't just say that. He said, even if all these other cats drop out on you, not me. Do you see what he's doing there? He's saying, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that really, I'm the devoted one. I'm the committed one here in this group. That's what he's saying. If all of these fail you, not me, Lord, I will not fail you. Now you say, would Peter do something like that? Did you read what we just read? These guys are always trying to find out who's the greatest. Absolutely, that's in the wheelhouse of Peter. He's saying, I, I would never do this. In Luke 22, the conversation continues, and the Lord says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Eklipo, that's the Greek word right there, means fail utterly, come to an end to die out. See, Jesus knows that he's going to fail him, but he says, I'm praying for you that you will not utterly fail, completely, utterly fail. Meaning completely surrender and give up on God. He says, I'm praying for you. But he says this, he says, I'm praying for you because you're, you're, Satan has desired and asked for you that he would sift you as wheat. But this is what Jesus said. And when you have returned... That's what we got in the King James Version right there. He says, and when you have returned, the word is actually when you have, when, when you, it says we return, when you have been converted. 
It says when you have returned to me, but the actual text in the actual manuscript says when you have converted. See, this is the exact same word that Peter uses in Acts chapter 3 when he says, repent and be converted. This is the exact same word. And Jesus is saying that when you are converted, see, he says, you're going to fail, but when you, refer, when you repent, when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He's still missing it, ain't he? He's still missing it because here the Lord is saying, you're going to fail, but it's okay. I, I got you. I'm, I'm going to restore you. And what I want you to do is I want you to turn and restore others, bring others back to, to in the, into the fold because they all will fail. Isn't that what he said? They all will be made to stumble. And Peter says, not me, Lord, again. Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He said, I'm, I'm ready and willing to pay the ultimate price. But you remember, he said, I don't know about these cats, but I am. I am. He's trying to show, he's trying to tell the Lord that I love you more than these. I want you to hold on to that for a minute. The conversation continues in John chapter 13. Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Will you, Peter? Will you? I don't know how Jesus did it. He said, will you? I don't know if he put his hands on it and said, really, will you, Peter? But this is what he says. He says, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, this is what's really going to happen. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Mr. I will never deny you. Mr. Oh, if oh, they, these cats might, but I'm not going to deny you. Okay, Mr. I will not deny you. You're going to deny me three times tonight before the rooster crows. This is what Jesus says. And in Mark 14 and 31, but he, Peter, spoke more vehemently. Vehemently, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. And all of them were like, Peter ain't going to outdo me. That's right. I, we, we will not deny you. If I have to die, we will not deny you. And what do we know? That later when Jesus was arrested from Mark's gospel, it says in verse 11, chapter 11, verse 50, then they all forsook him and fled. They all forsook him and fled. And it's here we return to our initial text. In verse 55 of chapter 22, now, when they had kindled a fire, Jesus has been arrested. Peter's following at a distance. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. This is Peter. Mr. I will not deny you. I will go to prison. I will die with you. I don't know about all these other guys. They, though they fail you, I will not fail you. And a certain servant girl, verse 56, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him, but he denied him, saying, woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, you also are of them, but Peter said, man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly kleo that's the greek word it means to weep aloud expressing uncontainable audible grief peter as you can imagine when he denied the third time and that rooster crowed and jesus from afar off however far he was looks over at peter now there's one thing i i'm very confident in that Jesus looked at him with broken heart eyes. But Jesus knew it was going to happen. But yet still, Peter denied him. 
despite his great confession. See, it's sometimes our confession of how great we're going to do for God that sometimes gives us the most paralysis and avoidance of God afterwards. Because I want you to know that when you fail the Lord, I want you to imagine the look that Jesus gave Peter. And I want you to know that he gives us that look. And I think part of the problem is that maybe we don't acknowledge that he's given us that look. Our doctrine today that is so off from the scriptures uh, would have us to believe that our sin is so covered in grace, it's almost as if God doesn't even acknowledge it. No, just because he's aware that he knows you, just like he knows Peter, he's very aware and it hurts him still. But the one thing that I, I want us to grab from this verse right here is that Peter did have something sincere and legitimate in his heart for Jesus. Because when he saw that he hurt the Lord, it broke his heart. But Jesus has a plan, a plan of restoration. So Jesus goes on and he suffers excruciating torture, dies on the cross. But as you remember what he said earlier, he says, I will return to you. And we see in John chapter 21, we see the account as Jesus is returning to them in Galilee. In John chapter 21, Jesus is resurrected and he has already visited the disciples two times prior to the instance we're going to be looking at here today. Two times prior to this, Jesus has visited the disciples. And the Bible says that for 40 days after he resurrected from the cross, uh, from the grave, for 40 days he remained, but he was intermittent in his visiting of the disciples. And after the 40 days, he ascended to be with the Father. This is the third occasion that we come to. And in John chapter 21, we read in verse 1, After these things... Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. I like the way that John does that very nice in his commentary. He says, Jesus came and showed him a third time. He says, but I want to tell you how it exactly went down. So he's going to back up before Jesus shows up. He says, but this is the way that it happened. Simon Peter, he begins, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. So there's like seven of them there. And Simon Peter said to them, Jesus has not arrived yet. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Now, first thing that we find too often is preachers have a tendency to be very creative. I want to try not to be creative outside of what the text shows us right here and do good hermeneutics and be obedient to the text. But there are some that would say, oh, look at Peter. He forsook the Lord and went back to fishing. Well, first off, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't buy that at all. Matter of fact, we know that Paul, after being called to be an apostle, there was a time while he was waiting on the Holy Spirit to lead him to the next thing that he went back to building tents. It's okay that he was working. They are waiting right there in Galilee because that's where the Lord was going to meet them. People say, why was he in Galilee and not in Jerusalem? Well, in Mark chapter 16 and verse 17, after the resurrection, there was an angel that appeared, and the angel said this. In Mark chapter 16, <laughs> in Mark chapter 16 and verse 7, wake up, sound room, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to, the, to you. Jesus had told them we're going to Galilee. Did Jesus tell them he was going to Galilee? Absolutely. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 32. This is what Jesus said. He said, but after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. So it's good that they were in Galilee. You know why? Because they were supposed to be. Jesus was going to meet them there. There's nothing wrong with them being in the Galilee. And there's nothing wrong with going fishing while the Lord's waiting on you. Are you while you're waiting on the Lord? He said, I'm going fishing. They said to him in verse 3 of chapter 21, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered him, No. 
And he said to them, cast the net on the other side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, John, we know who that is, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. Boy, that's about like Peter, ain't it? Now I believe that he really loves the Lord, but I also believe that in his heart he loves the Lord more than anybody. And I don't think it's outside of Peter's character to try to beat everybody to the Lord. I don't think it was necessarily outside of Peter's character what called him out on the water when he said, hey, can I come out there? He was the only one that stepped out. I, I, we know that he got in the flesh somewhere at that point and began to sink and, to, and he had to call out to the Lord for help. But it's just not outside of Peter's character to say, I'm, I'm, I'm there, me, me. I don't know about these other guys, but I'm there. I'm in the water first. And he plunged into the sea at verse 8. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about 200 cubits dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up, dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153, although there were so many the net was not broken. Jesus said to them in verse 12, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Do you love me more than these? That's a great question as to what Jesus was talking about when he says to Peter, do you love me more than these? So folks, I uh, believe that maybe he's talking about your fishing net and, and, and your boat, your career, you know, uh, or maybe these fish, all these fish, are, 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 are do you love me more than you love these other disciples as he's looking around? But I don't think that fits in harmony with not only what has previously happened, but with the way Jesus is going to tie all this back together. I think the most harmonious understanding is that Jesus is saying, do you really love me more than these guys? You say that you do. You claim that you do. Do you really love me more than these do love me? Well, if you really love me, more than they love me, you should be able to turn around and feed them. And he says to them, he says to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I, I think that almost everybody agrees and understands why Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Because there was three times that Peter had denied the Lord. And if the Lord had told him, you were going to deny me, you say that you love me. Oh, and those, all these others will forsake you. All these others may fail you, but not me. He's saying, I love you more than these guys do. I love you more than these. I will deny, not deny you. I will not forsake you. And yet, three times he denied him. And see, God was very aware the love of Jesus for Peter says, I know you have failed me. But all the way back from before, this says, I have a plan of restoration. When you are converted, when you come back to me, turn around 
and feed my sheep. Didn't he, didn't he say that? He says, help restore them. That's what he said. He says, when Peter said, I'll never leave you before Jesus was arrest, uh, uh, arrested, he said, he said, Jesus said, you're going to deny me, but once you're converted, once you come back, I want you to turn your attention to the other disciples and minister to them. That fits perfectly with what Jesus is saying right here. And he's making it, uh, re removing any doubt by doing this three times, just as Peter had denied him three times. But this is making it clear to Peter. I can imagine the grief and how Peter is realizing what's happening. Jesus is saying, I know you failed me three times, Peter. I know you denied me three times, but I'm saying to you three times, do you love me? Because I want you to not only know that I'm very much aware that you failed me, but I have a plan for you. Because you can see, he said, he didn't just say, do you love me and leave it at that. He says, if you love me, feed my sheep. What Jesus is doing right here, he has a plan to restore Peter and then to employ Peter. He has a plan of restoration and then ordination. See, because any time that we have failed the Lord and we have allowed that failure to, paral to cause us paralysis and we avoid God, God is having a plan and we need to believe that He has a plan to restore us and to anoint us and to ordain us to go and do His work. And, Paul, and, and Peter is learning right here from Jesus that I am very much aware of your failure, but I have a plan of restoration. And the, 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 the most important thing that we can do is realize, acknowledge that we failed Him and not let that failure cause us to fail, to be recommitted, reinstituted, and restored with God. And he goes on to continue to say, he says, most assuredly, Jesus says, after he says, you know I love you, you know all things, Lord, you know that I love you. 18, verse 18 says, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you guarded yourself and walked where you wished, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will guard you and carry you where you do not wish. This Jesus, H, capital H, this Verse 19, he spoke, signifying by what death he, Peter, would glorify God. And when he had spoken these words, he said to him, follow me. I love that. He says, we've dealt with this situation. I am reinstating you. Now it's time for you to do what disciples do and follow me. See, I love that about God because He's looking forward. He's looking to the future. All He wants to do is for you to get things right right now, and God has a plan to accomplish what He wants to accomplish in your life that's not coming to pass because we have not yet come to this point where we're ready to be restored to God. We're still avoiding Him. We're still pretending like it didn't happen. We don't want to think about it when all alone these things are still there. And we can pretend like it's not happened. We can pretend like we've not sinned. And we can pretend like we've not failed him and yet still wander around all the time while we're discontent in our relationship with God, while the joy of our salvation is no longer there, while God is not bringing us to the next place in our relationship because we are not where Peter is right here. We're not there yet. God's not moving us yet. He's not turned around and said, we got, this, we got this situation settled. Now come follow me. i got things for you to do. Feed my fish. I'm commissioning you. I'm ordaining you. The ordination of God, the commissioning of God, the empowerment and the mission that God has for you is possibly still at, oh, outside of your reach because you have not come to this place before God where you're ready to repent and say, I have failed you. We know that Peter said, I will never deny you, even to my very death. And Jesus is saying, your words will be true. You will be obedient to me, and it will be to your very death. See, all this is one conversation with God. All this is one conversation in God's heart as he's bringing all this to completion and understanding that you have failed me, that I had a plan all along. Jesus had a plan all along for his restoration. But I wonder today how paralyzed we still are because of our failures because of our sins. Sometimes we know it, we're aware of it. We say, I just can't be used. I've failed God. I'm unworthy. You know what? You were never worthy 
It's by His grace and His mercy that He wants to empower you to do something anyway. So that can't be the deal breaker. But you know what can be the deal breaker? The deal breaker can be our refusal to acknowledge our failure. God's very much aware of it. And our refusal to acknowledge it is what's hindered us and stopped our growth. We know, we, we, we can, we should, we should know if, we're in, if there are things in our lives that are an offense to God, we failed Him, or we're continuing to fail Him in a particular area of our life, and we're wondering why things are not working out. And we have not come to a place of brokenness before God. The place we need to come to is what John, the writer of this gospel, writes in his first epistle, 1 John, verse 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, a lot of us have not come to the place of being ready and willing to repent and confess our sins. See, we know that David failed the Lord. He failed him mightily. But we mentioned earlier, David had a heart of repentance. And we have an account of David's repentance in Psalms chapter 51. In Psalms chapter 51, we read this amazing verse that I, I think of often. I mentioned it to you. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, David writes in verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, the salvation that God brought to us. And it's a shame that so many in the church are convinced, they believe, that the joy of the salvation that you received whenever you received Christ Jesus is something that's just a one-time event that, oh my goodness, I just, man, I'll never forget what it was like when I first got saved. It's so bad that even people in the church who have been in the church for a while, been Christians for a while, they'll even tell that new believer, oh man, you got that, uh, that, that fire when you first get saved or something like that, as if it's a fleeting thing. If it's something that's supposed to become, I'm going to tell you, I've experienced the joy of the salvation of the Lord that I experienced when I first got saved. I've experienced it a bunch of times in my life. I experience it all the time. But you know when I experience it? Whenever I relive what happened the first time. You know what's stopping us from experiencing the joy of His salvation? What's, this, what's stopping us from having the experience we had when we first got saved, when the fire was so 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 hot and we were so excited, we were joy. We were at the church every time the doors would open. We couldn't get enough. We were reading our Bible all the time. We were praying all the time. You remember that? You know, you know what's stopping us from experiencing that? Is that we're not doing what got us there the first time. What got us there the first time was humility and repentance. When when we read things like, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and repent, this is a truth that's supposed to be ongoing in our lives unless we're greater than Peter, greater than, than even Peter after this, after being full of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and preaching. And, and, the, and the Bible says that people were just trying to get in his shadow. The power of the Holy Spirit was so mightily in his life that I'll get healed if I just get in his shadow. So powerful. And yet, he failed miserably after that. I can show you in that. But, but the point is, is that we fail God and so what is it that returns the joy of our salvation? It's what got the salvation there to begin with and it's this humbleness and this repentance. But see, we have a tendency to not repent like we did when we first got saved because when we first got saved, we come to the altar and we say, I know I don't know anything. I'm in desperate need of God. I don't know. I don't know the Word of God. I don't know the Bible. I, I, that's why I need to be in church all the time. That's why I need to read it all the time because I don't know it. And I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've failed you. And so I repent and I walk, come in with humility. But that's not the way we do it once we've been saved for a while. See, once we're saved for a while, we have this mentality that, you know what, I've been a Christian for so long and after this much time I need to know this, that, and the other. I need to know all about how end times goes. I need to know about all these different words, all these doctrines. I need to know and I need to establish them when the reality is that we are, are not humble anymore. See, we're not coming before the Lord like, I don't know anything, Lord. I'm in desperate need of you. It's this desperate need of an awareness of our desperate need of repentance and humility before God. And this is what happens when David comes before the God that he's been serving for so many years, the God that he knows so well, and yet this is what happens. In, in Psalms chapter 51, we see a clear 
process in the way that David repented before God. In the first five verses, we have a clear confession. In verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. I know I failed you. Wash me, I know I'm dirty, thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgression. Now this is the, the chapter that he says later, restore to me the joy of my salvation. How is that restored? He said, I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. I can't hide it. I can't deny it. I can't act like it's there. It's always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge, O oh God. Behold, I was brought forth iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. He acknowledges, he confesses, his sins and in verses 6 through 9 he pleads with God for the remission of sin without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sin right we know that we need to have our sin removed behold you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts you will make me to know wisdom purge me with hyssop I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow make me make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities the removal the remission of sins he says I acknowledge my sins and I plead with you for the removal of sins and then he goes for the restoration in verse 10 create in me a clean heart O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me do not cast Cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. See, this restoration is not happening in our lives because although David knew the Lord for many, many years, he had to take the same process. And so he could get the joy of his salvation, the salvation of God. He could experience that just like he first found God. He can experience it again because he comes to God the same way he came in the beginning. We need to be coming to God just like we did in the beginning. But we don't do that anymore. Repentance in the altar is for the lost people that need to speak and say, that's what's in our minds. We just think, I just need to acknowledge, oh, I messed up, Lord, it's all good. We're good. All right, I'm sorry about that. Well, where's the brokenness? The brokenness before God. Knowing, see, we don't think of it. Jesus looked over at us like he looked at Peter. We don't think about those things. We don't go and weep bitterly. We don't go and weep like Peter did. And just audibly and just, uh, just uncontrollably weeping before God. Because what is wrong with us? We lost what got us there in the first place. We need to maintain that because we will fail again. But we need to go before God like we did the first time and say, I am in desperate need of you. I have failed you. And then after restoration, just like we experience and we see with Peter, comes the commission. Because see, after he goes to the Lord for restoration, David says this in verse 13, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Isn't that what Jesus told Peter? He says, after you have been converted, after you have been restored, then you turn around, you feed my sheep, then you go and you restore others. See, somebody that has experienced the restoration of God has now been commissioned. That's why we see we say in 2 Corinthians 5.17 and goes on to 5.18, it says that we have been reconciled to God and we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Once we've been reconciled, once we've been restored with God, we have that ministry and that's exactly what happens with Peter. It's what happening with David right here as he said I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed O God the God of my salvation and my tongue well, my tongue, he says, my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness O Lord open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise after having confessed and acknowledged his sins he prays to God for the removal of sins and he pleads with God for restoration and believes in the commission, the ordination that follows. And that's what happens with Peter. That's what James, John is talking about when he says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful to and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Make you righteous before him. What does that do? That equips you to go to others. This is why we don't experience the joy of our salvation. Because when we fail, we don't follow the same expectation God always has for repentance. So the broken and contrite heart 
God will not refuse. Where are we at today with our failures? Where are we at today if we were to acknowledge our sin? What are we going to do today? Is the Lord challenging us? How will, we, how will we respond? It's not the failure, it's how we respond to that failure. Let's respond correctly today. 